Welcome to the Be Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. If you're new to this podcast, welcome. This is where I feature conversations with women who have inspirational stories to share. These are women who are on the cutting edge. They are kicking butt in major ways and forging their own paths to success. They come from a wide range of backgrounds and find themselves in an equally wide range of stages in their lives. The one thread they have in common is that they are bold in what they do. They follow what they love and somehow have created a lifestyle that supports it. It's when we hear stories about other people's success and triumph over obstacles that we become inspired. Really, it makes us feel like anything is possible. I personally believe that we all have the ability to become better versions of ourselves. And what I'm hoping is that you'll find pearls of wisdom in these conversations, bits of information that inspire and motivate you. I'm hoping you'll hear something that makes you want to change and make choices in your life that ultimately makes you happier and more fulfilled. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play and leave a review. And that literally just takes a couple of minutes. Those reviews are critical to building our Be Bold community. My guest today is Lois Ellen Frank. It's actually difficult to know where to start when introducing Lois because she is so accomplished at so many things. Lois is a chef, author, native foods historian, photographer, James Beard Award winner, and that's for her book, Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations. She has a Master of Arts in Cultural Anthropology and a PhD in Culinary Anthropology, and she focuses on foods of the indigenous tribes of the Americas. She's part Native herself from the Kiowa Nation, and that's on her mother's side. Lois works in the Native community by focusing on the importance of traditional foods in their culture. And I've known Lois for probably six or so years, and over that time I've seen her business develop and grow, and what she's been focusing on is getting the Native population back to eating their traditional foods, and this is making them healthier. They're losing weight, they're reducing their blood sugar levels, and uh, and their issues with diabetes. And it's really been fabulous for me to see how that uh, has evolved over the past uh, number of years. Through her company, Red Mesa Cuisine, Lois, along with her business partner, Walter Whitewater, they offer a pretty spectacular meal for our Santa Fe culinary tours. We enjoy this beautifully prepared meal that utilizes traditional ingredients, um, and it's traditional with just a few exceptions. We're eating squash and beans and corn chowder, and uh, the meat eaters uh, have bison. In addition to this beautifully prepared meal, we also get a lesson in food history, particularly as it relates to the Native Americans. And once you hear our conversation, you'll get an inkling as to what makes that dinner so special because you'll hear Lois speaking from the heart. Lois is really quite grounded and a very wise person, and it just becomes obvious that she puts a lot of love, thoughtfulness, and wisdom into her cooking. In this conversation, we talk about her childhood growing up on the East Coast and how at an early age, she was able to make money through her love of food and how her mother was so influential in fostering the idea that if Lois could dream it up, she could accomplish it. And that is so important for young people, for anyone to learn. When studying at culinary school, Lois got a lot of pushback, both as a woman and a person interested in native foods. She was actually told there was no such thing. We talk about how she was temporarily dissuaded in pursuing the culinary arts, Um, so she went on to become an accomplished food photographer. But she found herself surrounded by foods that she was ethically opposed to until a comment by a mentor just ruined it, quote-unquote ruined it for her, and she knew she had to change the trajectory of her life. We recorded at Lois's home outside of Santa Fe, and it was so peaceful there. You'll actually hear a chorus of cicadas uh, during our conversation. As you'll hear, Lois's life has had some twists and turns, but it was when she started listening to her gut that she started to really find and follow her passion. And I think that is such an important lesson. We may feel lost or out of sorts with where we are at any given time, but if we just slow down pause and listen to our gut, listen to our heart, the 
the path is right in front of us. With that, please enjoy this conversation with Lois Ellen Frank. Thank you so much for having me in your home today in the beautiful, would you just say, like I tell people, uh, Lois lives out in the desert. Is that is that a pretty accurate description? Uh, I would say that I live in, um, outside of Santa Fe, uh, it's actually east and north, but it's a little more prairie, so it's not the Pinon Jupiter. You know, when you start to look at Santa Fe and you start to go up to the ski basin, the landscape changes. There's aspens, there's a lot more pine trees, and this is a little, an ecozone just below that. There is grassland, there is prairie, it's a little more open, uh, but there is some pinyon and some uh, juniper, so it's a little bit different. So yeah. it sounds sexier to me if I say, "Who she lives out in the desert," <laughs> rather than like, "But it in is the, the desert." But in the future, high desert. Okay, but in the future, I guess I'm going to have to say, uh, "She lives out in the prairie." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's not a true prairie, but it is grassland. Okay, there's more grassland. Good. Well, there. it's always beautiful. We have a um, we have a cooking class that we do out here as part of our Santa Fe culinary tour, and we come out uh, late in the afternoon. Sun sundown is probably eight or seven thirty, eight o'clock somewhere around there. I think this time of year uh, in June, and there's always there's either a little storm going on, but it's always a beautiful sunset. And the uh, you know many times I've been out here, there's just this great lightning storm that happens in the you know it's just beautiful. way off in the so distance. I oh, really, just yeah, I like seeing the vistas mm -hmm. as opposed to being closed in in a forest. So that it's very vista orientated. And you, you see the mountains, you see the lightning, uh, it'll rain, and then within 15 minutes, it'll clear, and just blows sometimes over. it's windy, sometimes it's still. I mm -hmm. really like that. Yeah. The other thing, too, just a description for listeners, is that um, there's no high, tall buildings here, too. So when you drive out, you can just barely see kind of the rooftops of the adobe homes, and uh, and I just love that, too, because it's like your little hidden oasis That's here. intentional. Yeah. So that's, you know, a planned, orchestrated uh, covenants, I guess, for lack of a better word, where you want to allow your neighbors to see, you want to be able to see. And so, yeah, it's gorgeous. It is really is. So anyway, thank you for having me here and um, uh, being such a great host and cook. There's tamales on. So we're going to take a break at some point <laughs> <laughs> and have some yummy tamales. What I would love for you to do is just to kind of start out by telling us a little bit about yourself your books, your projects, the things that you're doing, so uh, we can get an idea of where you are right now. And then we're going to backtrack a little bit and find out what brought you to this point. So I'm a classically trained uh, Native American chef. Uh, I'm a woman, uh, which when I was uh, being trained or um, in cooking school, culinary school, uh, women were the minority. I, when we look at uh, commercial kitchen, it's definitely dominated by men. I left culinary school and uh, my undergraduate degree is in photography, which oddly enough is another career dominated by men. Worked in Los Angeles, went to school in Santa Barbara, really, really beautiful, really enjoyed everything. But unfortunately, the people that have money uh, in the photography industry are not the sprout farmers and the carrot farmers <laughs> it's the large corporations so that ethically um, was an issue for me the next trajectory was moving to santa fe realizing that uh, i felt very at home here so i grew up on the east coast lived on the west coast ended up in the middle and finding a way to create balance so doing some cooking classes at the santa fe school of cooking uh, still being a chef being an academic and uh, speaking, working with doctors, nurse practitioners, being certified with the CDC as a diabetes educator, having a PhD, being a doctor chef, and being able to construct menus from my research, and working uh, in things that feel good, in where you know doctors heal through medicine or an acupuncturist heals through needles, and and I really nurture and heal through food and there's something very fulfilling and very beautiful in that process. I, I like to know where my food comes from. I like to know my farmers. I do know all of them. I've been to their farms I'm working. Uh, I'm, I'm very heavily uh, focused on plants but I'm not completely plant-based in my life and uh, being able to make delicious food where people feel nurtured and they've been educated about 
where the food come from and the story. What's the story? I like stories. Uh, so a little bit more specifically, because that's like, because I know that there is so much depth to what you're doing. You have uh, how many books out? I have uh, Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations, and then I also did a book uh, called Taco Table with the Western National Parks, because my belief is when we go to a beautiful park, whether it's um, the Grand Canyon or Monument Valley or uh, any of the other Western parks, that we see food that's locally sourced in the restaurants mm -hmm. at the parks. And we don't see food, uh, for instance, why would you want to eat Maryland crab cakes in the Grand Canyon? I want to go to the Maryland seashore and I want to eat Maryland crab cakes at the perfect season in that park. And I want to eat locally sourced foods that are native and support those economic enterprises uh, with the parks in the Grand Canyon. So I'm a big proponent of forming relationships. And so I don't get any royalties on the book and all of that goes there. I've worked on the bean book, the great chili book. I've done a series of food posters, which we've just brought back in. And uh, I have two more books sort of in the works. One is the turquoise plate, which is the story of the chefs that were a part of my PhD. And then I want to do a book on the three sisters. I want to do a plant-based book. So a number of books. And what I'll do is I'll link to those in the show notes too, so people can find those books. And your dissertation, I saw your your book. <laughs> 504 pages. Yes, you wrote uh, pretty extensive. What is that about? Kind of what's the synopsis of that? The um, actual title is called The Discourse and Practice of Native American Cuisine, which was very intentional because I was told Native people didn't have a cuisine. But so the discourse and practice of Native American cuisine, Native American cooks, and Native American chefs. So I wanted to include both the professional genre and the non-professional, maybe it's a grandma, uh, in contemporary Southwest kitchens. Um, academics love you to really have a lot of words. So, so that's the working title. Where do you even start to do research for something like that? The first part of that was to go back in time and say, well, what were the indigenous foods and how did food change historically from 10,000 years ago up until now? What happened uh, to Native people and why did their diet change? And so I broke it down into four periods, the pre-contact period, the first contact period, the government issue period, and the new Native. And then uh, once you understand the basis, then we have to say, well, who's cooking that food? And how are they cooking it? And why are they cooking it? And where do we see differences in each tribe? You know, And when we look at the Southwest, it sounds like it's a cohesive area that's all the same. But we really go from Tucson, right, southern Arizona, or the Pasquayaki, or the Gila River, or the Salt River in Phoenix, all the way up to the Ute in southern Colorado. And so the ecozones in those areas go from low desert at Saguaro, or what we call the standing people, to high desert like we have here or pine forests and the flora and the fauna changes and as the flora and fauna changes so does the diet in those native communities and so I really wanted to be able to um, talk about that and give uh, examples of different people so I drew boundaries because so I did southern Colorado southern Utah uh, New Mexico and Arizona and I stopped at the river between Arizona and California because then uh, I felt like that goes into the west but some people would classify some of those tribes along the river there as um, being southwest so demographically you just have to make a decision and then say who's in that boundary so that's what I did. Have there been any other study like that done previously or were you really a innovator in that area? Uh, I don't think there was anything specifically what I did there's been a lot of um, historical accounts of what people ate in the past, um, as if Native people are still in a museum and they're all gone, the vanishing Indian. And I really tried to keep it present and evolving and alive. Uh, there is, um, Native people are here. It's just, what are they doing? So there are some beautiful artifacts and museums are a great way to learn the past, but I didn't want to focus on what was only. I wanted to focus on what was, what happened, what is, and what will be. So in terms of health and wellness. If listeners can hear a little bit of buzzing there. There they go. That's the cicadas. Right. I don't know if that'll come through on the recording, but uh, I had to stop and, and just check to make sure that I wasn't having an equipment malfunction. <laughs> well, while we're yeah. on that topic, I think, um, you know, 
what it, um, a big part of, of what I do and what I try and bring uh, the attention to people's consciousness is wherever you are, if you tune in, turn on, tap into, there are, I think Georgia O'Keeffe was famous for her landscapes. But what is a landscape? A landscape are the sounds, the smells, uh, the vistas, and the food. You know, so I talk a lot about a foodscape. You know, when I do a dinner, I want courses of the foodscape. I want you to smell. I want you to listen. And you heard the cicadas, but a lot of people don't listen. They just go about their way. Or you go to a city, you go to New York, and you, what are the smells? The smells are completely different than in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The smells in Seattle are completely different. You smell the water. Here you smell the desert. And when it rains, you smell the rain in the desert. It's, it completely changes the smell. And so I really try and encourage people to pay attention to where you are. Um, when you're at sea level, it's a different feeling than when you're not at sea level. There are different sounds and different smells and the sun is different and the warmth is different and the rain is different. And just let that be a part of your process, your trip, your adventure, your tour whatever it is, because there's so much to learn from what do the birds sound like? And the birds are different here than they are where you are. So it's, um, I love that. This is probably a loaded question. I'm, I, I'm not sure if I know the answer to it or not or how you might respond. You've been doing this a long time, and uh, our culture has changed so much just in the last really, you know, seven, eight years with with iPhones and smartphones and people not paying attention and spending more time um, looking at things and photographing them with their phone and not really listening to the cicadas cicadas and and the animals or smelling things. Have you noticed a difference or do you think in in Santa Fe it's a little bit different that people are pretty tuned in? So I've been here in, in this particular spot where we're sitting since 1995, and there is a difference. There's more homes. There's a paved road. Uh, you know, it's it, it's evolving uh, slowly, but there's still coyotes at night, and there's still a hawk, and there's morning doves, and there's quails, and I love to watch the migrating birds, and I always leave enough of what I grow, whether it's the wild currants or the choke cherries or the yucca so that the animals and I share and I don't fence things in so I have bunnies and they eat too and I I allow that because to me that's a part of the process and we all are in this together. You allow that. Do you observe that others are allowing that? I think here in this community where I am, there is that sort of consciousness. There's a couple people that are anti-coyotes or anti-this or anti-that. But for the most part, people move here to be with nature and coexist with nature. And those that don't and want to cut their lawn and have things paved don't last very long because that's really not what the, the majority of us are about here. Yeah. So Santa Fe just doesn't re- resonate with the person who comes here and uh, they're expecting. It's kind of like... Um, it's a little slower. Yeah. It's almost like living on an island. You either you arrive and you get it or you don't get it. And, and you leave. And you leave. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you totally. Know, there's different strokes for different folks. And I love to go to very remote places and see what is happening there when I travel, but I also like to go into an urban environment and city. I just can't do the city on a constant basis because it's too fast for me. I was growing up, my family always said, you're a country mouse, you know, with a little backpack and a little uh, And you snacks. grew up in New York, is that I right? I did, so yeah. I didn't fit in well. Actually, Long Island, both my parents worked in the city. I did better uh, further out on Long Island in the very uh, remote areas of the Hampton. I had a garden there and I worked in restaurants there and I had a lot of culinary experiences there. So I do better in um, uh, a little more remote, a little quieter, a little more country. And so, that's just me personally. And you were born there? I was born actually in New York City, went to school growing up on the North Shore of Long Island and then uh, moved further out to the South Shore uh, what is now the Hamptons. It really wasn't, didn't have that same genre back then. It was always the Hamptons, but just not for the elite of the elite. It was um, potato farmers and bands and some restaurants and good food. And you went out to get out of the city to be. And how much time did you spend there how, uh, in your life? Years, growing up since I was very small and then working uh, after culinary school and during culinary school in 
So early 20s or so? or Up until about, yeah, early 20s. Yeah. What was the experience kind of, uh, so you, you have a kind of a mixed background, part Native mm-hmm. American, right. part Sephardic Jew, Jewish is that right? Yeah. Side. So w- what brought the Native American part to the New York area? My dad is first generation through Ellis Island, so both his parents immigrated uh, 1899 and 1903, and he was raised in Brooklyn, um, so he had a very uh, work ethic, uh, work hard, get a show, get on the road, the salesman type of mentality, first generation immigrant, and he did. He was in the garment business and worked very, very hard. My mom was uh, originally from Oklahoma and then spent some time in um, Florida, northern Florida, and then they, her family migrated a little further south and uh, much different, um, a little bit more slow, spiritual. Um, my mom is very, was very tall and very strikingly beautiful. So, you know, her little girl pictures are braids, <laughs> but this, you know, elongated face and very tall, thin body. And she was discovered in Miami. She went to Cuba in the 50s before we were no longer able to go there and did runway shows and dresses. So she was a model. She She's was a model, yeah, very yeah. strikingly beautiful. And then went to New York and was discovered by several agencies, Stewart Agency, Ford Agency, and did everything from Vogue covers to really high fashion and then fell in love, got married, had kids, and then did more Sears catalog. I remember growing up, <laughs> there was this ladder that was being sold, you know, that you could put on your second story because everybody, of course, on the East Coast has two story homes. And you could have this rope ladder if there was a fire and you could climb down and save yourself. And my mom was the model on the front cover <laughs> of that packaging. So she did a lot of uh, things that s- were slowed down, but she modeled all the way into her 60s. Mm. And then she started. Uh, with her very dark hair and a natural look and then went a little blonder as she got older. And, you know, you can see the, she used to have these styrofoam heads with wigs and, um, you know, the three mirrors. And my sister has the same body as her and loved that idea of makeup. And I was a little bit more the other way. How many siblings? I have a sister and a brother. So it's me, my brother, my sister. So you said your dad was in sales? My dad, uh, um, yeah, uh, sales but leisure wear and he named a company after my mom Jean West Fashions and I don't know if you remember in this I can't remember if it was late 70s or 80s but they had like leisure wear that was velour and a a top and a pant suit that you could wear sort of out but it was very leisure wear he did a lot of that type of thing and um, dresses that were uh, in Sears. So my mom did a lot of that modeling. They worked together as she moved out of high fashion, you know, the corset and the tiny waist and um, into having three kids and being a working mom. And I think I'm from New Jersey. So I, I think that they're still wearing that leisure wear with gold chains there. <laughs> <laughs> that, I am pretty certain. I used to sell those. Yeah. 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 I've seen that in a lot of the pizza places. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that was, it was big on the East Coast. Yeah. yeah. Still is. And yeah. he did a lot with Sears and Sears. It was Sears and Roebuck then the catalogs, and this leisure wear. So dresses or suits or velour, yeah. So I'm sorry, go back. Your siblings, you have? I have a, a brother who's 13 months younger than me and then my sister who's 18 months younger than him. So one, two, three. And then I have an older brother who's 11 years older than me from my dad's first marriage. So we share the same dad, but different moms. They're, they weren't chefs. They weren't into cooking necessarily. How, what so, happened to you? We're so different. <laughs> I think what's really interesting is when you get um, parents that are uh, ethnically different and genetically different, um, it's a, the luck of the draw of what you're going to get in terms of how you're going to look. Um, the three of us don't even really look alike and everybody says same mother same father and we're like far as we know but uh so you know my sister got different genetics my brother different you know because my parents are different you know when you have so kids can be like the mom's side or the dad's side or something in between and when they're ethnically different you get these all over and I would say that the same thing um my sister loves to cook now but she's really focused on non-profit she had some health issues and has dedicated her life to helping being a patient advocate and helping others that have, she has a disease, so helping others that have a disease like her or a rare disease. And my brother, uh, very bright, very science-orientated, and I think focused a lot of his life, he has a PhD from Stanford, 
on immunology. So what causes the body to do what? And part of that interest and that want was because my sister has a rare disease. So he's always been focused on how drugs work and what the diseases are and how the immune system responds. And then helping companies get those drugs to the market and so she must making have, sure that they're uh, what they say they're going to do. She must have been diagnosed quite early yes. for them to then go into careers like they knew early on right. that they wanted to go into these careers yeah, to help out. My sister was probably 11 or 12. And meanwhile, you're out in the garden. <laughs> Pretty much. Horses, gardens. I, I was much more orientated towards... Uh, you just wanted to be outside? Or what, what, what was it that drew you... I guess from the earth, you know, the the plants. I my mom had a garden. She read Rachel Carson. She I Im, implied or you know put into us the idea that everything is connected and that there is this medicine wheel. And I remember growing up, and even though we grew up urban, my mom would say, "Never be afraid of the dark." And I always thought that was an interesting to, thing to say in an urban area. She said, "If you're in the dark and no one can see you." then no one can hurt you. And I thought, what an interesting to s- thing to say in an urban area. So I've never really been afraid of the dark. And you know, living out here, there's no street lights. And sure, you can watch a scary movie and, and implant your thought process with scary things. But if you don't let that into your being, the coyotes aren't going to bother you. They're not out to get you. Nothing's really out to get you. It's very beautiful. And I've always been more gravitated towards that essence in my dance, in my ceremonies, in my food, in my life being uh, attracted to the earth and what comes from the earth, who lives on the earth, how do we live on the earth, and how do we, you know, I'm very conscious, I'm constantly picking out plastic bottles of the trash when I work, do events with my staff. We can recycle this, and we can recycle this, and they laugh at me, but if I don't live it and I don't walk it, then how can I expect anyone else to follow me? So I, I have to make an example. And we compost. And one of my wait staff has chickens. So we have a chicken bucket. So everything has an intention. Everything has a purpose. And I just always live that way. So she was very much living, uh, in some ways, a very progressive life, right? Because she's a model and she's working. And right. that's and at that time, that was probably a little bit unusual. I mean, I just know from my own experience with my family that it, that uh, it, my mom didn't get a job until later. So she's working, yet she had this still this philosophy that was from her culture right. that she was instilling in all in, of us. Yeah. And it really resonated with me. And, you know, my mom did deviate. So I was born in 1960 and my mom was 31, which is old at that time. It's not old now, but it was old at that time. And then had three kids between, you know, 31 and 35 and still worked. She was always very dirty clothes. You have three kids, you know, and they're very close in age. And I'm sure there was tons of laundry. And I remember having these buckets, you know, like a garbage pail. And she said, white colored dark and we had to separate our laundry so she could wash it for her we had to put it in. and if we didn't separate it she wouldn't wash it and then rather than bringing it upstairs to all of our bedrooms and putting it away for us we each had a step on the stairs Lois Greg and Cindy and she would put our clean clothes on the step and we had to carry it up to our room so there were always little training things that she did to make us independent and self-sufficient and she felt it was important for my brother to learn how to cook and me to learn how to cook and my sister, as well as being cleaning and cooking and all of the things that you, life skills, I guess. The gardening uh, resonated with you. The cooking resonated with you. So early on, did you think like, uh, you know, when we were, I, I'm just guessing when you were 12 or, you know, just early teens, were you thinking one day I'm going to, this is going to be my career. It, did you think that? No, but it did morph or evolve that way. I probably was, I think, 11, maybe 11. And my mom had a garden, so we had produce. And we had this little stand at the end of our road out in the the home in Remsenburg, it was called, which is just before West Hampton. So there's Eastport, Remsenburg, West Hampton. And I noticed that the vegetables didn't move as quickly. So one year we had like tons of carrots and tons of zucchini. And I was like, you know, if I make these little tiny mini zucchini breads or carrot breads that I would sell out. And so my mom really encouraged, if we had an idea, she would encourage us to follow through. So I did. I started baking. And then I went a step further from the stand to the first health food store. It was on Main Street in West Hampton. And the health food store owner started buying 
Brits. And, you know, we're talking 70s, right? So a little before you had to have a certified kitchen and I'm 11 or 12 years old, so I'm paying for this health food store, you know, which mm-hmm. as I got older, I it changed because you did need all of those things. But uh, that was my first job was selling my breads. That's amazing. To a health food store. And um, the owner's name was Fern. I can't remember her last name, but I always remembered her first name. And she was the first one to have uh, health foods in this remote area of Long Island. And so there were my breads and we still did the stand. And then as I got a little older, I realized I needed skills to do this. And my mom let me during, I think probably ninth grade, I graduated a year early. So I was 11th grade. So the three years of high school for me, uh, once a week, I could have one to two friends over and we could take a cookbook and make a recipe or make several recipes. And some worked well, some didn't, some, we but didn't you were like experimenting. We were experimenting. And both genders, male and female, would come over. And some of, you know, now we're on Facebook and some of my old friends say, remember when? I love it. And we did. We did made recipes. And I was very vegetarian focused for a long time, vegan focused. And then I went back to meat. So I've sort of done a little of everything. I think I've always been a little more plant focused. Uh, I was a private cook for some wealthy families in the Hamptons, very young. I was 16. And then I... Um, after I graduated high school, went to culinary school. So you really had some skills early on, and you had such a strong notion about what you wanted to do that there was just no doubt. Yeah. And it sounds like your family fostered that too, kind of helped that right, right along. I don't, I don't, I don't know that that is so usual. You know, I that's that's uh, pretty special. I guess, yeah. When when I think about it, uh, the one thing that my mom really pushed in us and made us believe was that if you can think it, you can manifest it. All life is is about figuring out how. How do you manifest that? How do you attract that into your life? And would she literally use those words to you, or is that no, a sense are, that you got? No, those are my words. But you know, so my dad was Jewish. She was raised. Southern Baptist and Native, so there's different, you know, like the Southern Baptist came into the Native communities, and there's Native spirituality, and she instilled everything in all of us, and I do remember being about 16 and thinking, you know, I, I started to read Lao Tzu, and I started to read the Tao Te Ching, and I started to look at other religions, and, you know, to this day, I really look at religion as it doesn't matter how you get to the center, like the bicycle wheel. So you can have Hindu and Buddhism and Christianity and Judaism and any other religion. And it doesn't matter how you get to that center as long as you're in the center. And I think all religions have a lot of beauty and a lot of good in them. It's just whenever you get too extreme in one direction, it gets off kilter. But it doesn't matter how you do that as long as you do that as long as you have love thy neighbor and you have a lot of the philosophies of helping and family and tithing and giving back and inclusiveness and we're we are all family the the earth is only one and there was a lot of that and that's carried through my spiritual belief my mental belief my uh, physical and and also how i approach the ethics of my business you know, and I, and I think as I run a business, I'm a lot more B Corp orientated than I am C Corp. So I do want to make a profit. So I'm not a nonprofit, but I want to make a profit with ethics. And you want to give back in the process. And I want to give back in the process. And if all of us started to do that on some small level, the world would completely be a different place. Mm-hmm. Because uh, cap- there's nothing wrong with capitalism. But how do we do capitalism by giving back or tithing or doing a scholarship or helping a Native community or building a school or building uh, a, a medical clinic or just a scholarship, anything that is... And to me, it goes back to that medicine wheel in Native tradition, that circle of life, that circle of all of us in it together and all of us helping each other. So uh, all of those have carried through. And I am much more B Corp orientated. I'm, and I, I would, you are too. Yeah, I think to a certain degree. We give, on a, and during all of our international programs, which oftentimes we're traveling to developing countries. So on their international tours, there's always a giving back program as part of that. So it's kind of neat. We'll go to an orphanage or we'll go to a, uh, in Bhutan, we support a um, organization that helps women of domestic violence. And, you know, we'll donate money and we'll go see what they're all about. And it's really just kind of broadening our minds and kind of understanding a culture a little bit more from that. So I, I do totally understand that. Uh, of course, not everybody understands that or even knows where to start in terms of that. And I think that's one of the 
issues. I, I think there's more of that conversation and the fact that there is a B Corp. And it's, I think even in Washington state, I'm not even sure if we, can you register as a B Corp now? And that's more, that's kind of a New Mexico, I don't, New Mexico, the last time I looked, New Mexico, and I'm not a registered B Corp, um, I'm an LLC. The last time I looked, New Mexico d- didn't have any. Yeah, that's, I think California is the first, they led with it. And for people who don't know, and I'm, I don't have all the details of it, but it's being able to set up your business so that there is an element of giving back yeah. as part of it. So there's probably special ta- tax breaks. And I don't, I think it's just starting to come into the consciousness across the country that that's an, that's, that's an option. And it's just, a, I think it's a philosophy um, that companies can take. And I think that's really important. And whether you run it as an, you are an, a, strictly it's an LLC. Using that model. Right, right. it is. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Well, you know, for all of your listeners and, and, and everybody that's a part of um, just their daily life. So even if you work for someone else, you know, how can you give back? You can uh, go online and buy hand harvested wild rice from a native community where all the proceeds go to protecting that land and keeping that wild rice alive and perpetuating that. Same thing with cornmeal, same thing. There are a million ways to actively, so it's not a passive thing. I believe that everybody can make conscious choices on a daily level. Do you buy seventh generation products that help uh, without phosphorus or without um, chemicals that hurt the earth? Or do you ignore that and just go about your way and go mainstream? Or do you buy from, if you if you are going to eat fast food from a fast food corporation that is um, raising or buying animals raised in a humane way? And th- I'm very um, proactive. I believe everybody can participate and there's room for everybody to join on. I've, I've heard you say this before and I, and it really sunk in <clears throat> the most recent time I heard you say this. It's you will go to the farmer's market and you will purchase the local produce. And part of that is really not only is it probably very high quality, but it also encourages them to continue with their business. It tells them in a, in a very real way, I value what you are doing. Please continue to do it. Exactly. And, um, you know, I am, uh, I buy things off of Amazon, you know, I I, do too. Yeah. But there is something to be said. I buy biodegradable, uh, paper products on Amazon that are, yeah, plastic, but yeah, so I'm doing a good thing, but through Amazon. So yeah. Yeah. There is, there is a place for that. But I also think, you know, I've, uh, and so many of them are gone now, but I've always loved going into small bookstores and purchasing directly from, from those folks just to kind of continue that and foster that. And I think that's really important uh, as well. And I see you doing it just on that, on a, on a really interesting level in terms of the foods and what you have available around here too. I think that's a really well, like important the, message. The, there's a wild tea and there's a husband and wife um, that harvest it and package it and they have the little cards and there's really no room for me to do a markup and it's not a big deal. I do events and people love to take home their products. So I might buy 15 or 20 packages of their little tea. I serve the tea Mm -hmm. and then people can buy it. Uh, I don't lose money. It doesn't take any extra effort. I support them and it's a feel good. And, um, I recommend people can mail order from them and they say, Oh, and you know, and then their incentive is to keep, harvesting this one little wild food in the wild and and go out and package it and it perpetuates the knowledge surrounding that how to do it the plant and um supporting them so i'm uh, it's all those steps and then if you come along and you say oh I'll, here i'll buy that then we're all in it together so it's not just me using it as a chef in my company red mesa it's also then selling whatever excess and then people can take it home and enjoy it there's medicinal benefits and we're supporting this little husband and wife that That's harvest great. these little wild foods. Let's go back to you. Th- did you say that you finished high school early? I did. I yeah. graduated a year early. Okay. And then from there you went directly to culinary school. Uh, I took a little bit of time off and then I went to culinary school and was it difficult for you to, to get through school socially? Was it difficult for you to get through school so quickly? Was that an anomaly? And did your friends think you were strange? Or was that just like, oh, there's Lois doing her thing? I would say that I was always on the periphery. I didn't, I never felt like where we went to school was my exact perfect place to be. I was always a little bit on the periphery. And, you know, when you're young, you want to fit in. And I realized at a certain point that I I just wasn't 
it's a square peg and I'm trying to put it in a round hole and I'm, it's never going to fit. And so rather than cutting the edges and trying to make it fit and become something it's not, I might as well be a square peg and forget the round hole. And everyone's going to say, just embrace it, just embrace it. So I embraced the differences and the periphery and being a little outside the box, not the norm. Um, And I was okay with that. I, I do believe that, you know, kid, it's very hard. There's that awkward period. And then you have to get comfortable in your skin. Who are you and what are you meant to do and how are you meant to do it? And feeling okay. I know, you know, kids now face bullying and there's cyber bullying and, and, and things like that. And I, yeah, I was teased. Um, kids are mean. They were mean then, they're <laughs> mean now. But I realized that I was on a different tangency and, um, you know, there are a lot of religions and a lot of yoga and I do a Korean yoga and, you know, they call it the bird of the soul, your life's purpose. And I think that's very aligned with a native way of thinking. And the more I could get in touch with it, the more I felt good, even if other people had trouble accepting that. So uh, you took a little time off and then you went to culinary school. Right. And where was that? On Long Island. So um, mm-hmm. Culinary Institute. And it was very good. I didn't finish because I was told two things. Uh, one, that uh, I was a woman or a young woman and that women would never be executive chefs or chef owners. Women didn't really cross that culinary gender line till the 80s. So I was before that curve. And the other thing was that as we studied American cuisine, that American cuisine was made up of all the immigrant contributions, which is half true, but there was no native voice. And, you know, I've always been a little bit of a black sheep raise my hand, you know, and risk being, oh, having to do more work or, you know, um, different punishments, so to say, and that Native people didn't have a cuisine. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. But I was young and I didn't have any credentials. And, you know, I always think of that movie, Julia and Julie. And I think Julia Childs faced the same thing. She went to school in Paris and it was men. And she went home and practiced chopping onions so that when she got to her class, Mm -hmm. she had the mound of onions and it was more and quicker than anyone else. And I think women in the culinary industry have had for many years to, and it's, it's still there if you're, depending on the environment, it could be five to one, 10 to one, 20 to one. I've done dinners where I'm the only woman. Um, So when you heard those messages of, you know, women will never be executive chefs and there's no Native American cuisine, what did that do for you? Uh, for me, it, it does the opposite of what it might do for most people where, you know, the, you, you're put down and you're told. It does set me off sometimes on a different trajectory. So I left culinary school, went to photography school. The thought of always working under a man didn't sit well. It wasn't who I am. It wasn't in my being. I knew it wasn't true. Uh, I just didn't know exactly how things were going. The trajectory was going to happen. You know, I always knew it was food. So I started as a chef. That wasn't quite exactly. So then I went into photography, also dominated by men. If you look at all the movie credits to this day, there are very few women directors Mm -hmm. and very few women DP. So DP stands for director of photography. You can be a producer, you know, or a production assistant. And it's like, that's not working for me. So, you know, then I left that and I went into another area. And every time someone says something for me, it's like, really? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, And it makes me want to do it more. So it gives you a little bit of a spark. A spark. Mm -hmm. So you get a spark by uh, someone telling you you can't do something. I do. Where do you think that, that spark comes from? I don't know. Maybe part my dad, part my mom. Uh, also realizing I, I've done a lot of personal work and a lot of work, you know, bringing in other cultural traditions and a lot of Native work. And what I've realized is that if we were all the same, the world wouldn't be as beautiful as it is. It's the differences. And it's okay for us to want different things and to be ethically different and to appreciate that and to learn that. And I, a lot of that is, you know, my mom, this idea of, Uh, being appreciative of the differences and being ethnically mixed. We weren't, you know, we grew up in a neighborhood that was Irish Catholic and Italian Catholic. And 
uh, all of my friends went to mass every day and they went to St. Mary's and I went to the public school and you know, I wanted to be like them, but I wasn't. And no matter how hard I tried, I, I couldn't be who they were. I had to be who I was. And it's about being comfortable in your own skin and your own shoes and regardless of the prejudices or the... Um, were you comfortable even at 11, 12, 13, 14 in your own skin? To a degree. There's always that, uh, you know... Um, tinsel teeth, uh, mm -hmm. pimply face, you know, as you're growing mm -hmm. up, all of those things that happen to your body. But you had something in your core that it's said, core. this is, this is Lois. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not, uh, although I, I, I know it's food. I know it's the earth. I don't know exactly how it's going to manifest, but as long as you keep, you know, and then if I went down a pathway and that's the other thing that is really important, you know, the most important thing is to make a decision. I'm going to go left and you go left and you're like, Oh, now I'm going left and I'm a photographer in Los Angeles photographing fast food because that's corporations that have the money to pay me, which is rewarding and lucrative. But ethically, it doesn't work for me. How long and did you do that? Eight years. Oh, wow. That's a long time. Right. And being comfortable to say, okay, I'm going down a trajectory that if I keep going, 50 years are going to go by and I'm not going to have done what I wanted. And so making a definitive decision, even though it's scary, how am I going to support myself? And what's my career going to look like? And what if I, you know, of saying, I didn't like that turn. I'm now going to go right and see what happens in my life. So how do you make that transition? Like go back to that time. And, okay. and so okay. you're working for, let's say, eight years doing something. So that I'm in Los Angeles. I have a studio. It's a commercial studio. I'm working for a lot of corporations. It's very rewarding. It's also very stressful. I'm making good money. And ethically, I'm promoting foods that I don't eat and in some instances haven't eaten since I saw how and, and where the food is coming from and how it's being prepared and, and the ethics, the ethics and making a decision. Okay, I have to transition. So slowly, you know, I, I knew I wanted to leave. I loaded a truck. I put my phone on call forward. I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I lived um, on the north side of town until I wanted to look around and buy a place. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I put my phone on call forward. I didn't tell a soul that I left. I flew back once or twice or three times a week. Until, to work. To work. To, to continue sure. to work. Okay. Yeah. So you're transitioning, but knowing in my being, and you also native in native ideology, we're taught to listen to our dreams and our feelings, that gut so if, if you do something, some people call it muscle testing or, I mean, there's a million ways to define what you do, you know, where you, you test and if there's resistance in your body, it's not good for you. Or if your gut is in knots and you're like, I know I shouldn't, I know I don't want to do this, but I feel like I should, or I have to do this. And it always turns to a disaster anyway. So what we have to do is learn to follow the gut and feel good about it, even though it's scary and not know, you know, on, on the risk of how is the universe going to provide? How am I going to make a living? That it will. And so it does. During that time when you were the, when you were a photographer and you're maybe photographing some nuggets, right? <laughs> let's say. For lack of a better let's, word. Let's call it uh, food. And so something because was kind of probably There's always a trigger for me. So I had an elder who came to the studio and uh, a famous photographer. He was just amazing. I mean, uh, I aspired to, you know, but he had always followed. He was always periphery, not doing mainstream. And he looked at what I, we were photographing and he said, oh, is this the poetry from within? is this your life's purpose? And I was like, oh man, would you just, I mean, part of you feels like just leave me alone. I'm making good money. But in hindsight, as I look back, I still have friends in that industry that are doing the same thing mm -hmm. and they're miserable. So something happened with you. There was a trigger and it just flipped you. And you said, I've got to, I have to make a change. Yeah. Do I want to live with myself doing this, knowing that I'm not eating this food and I'm telling everybody else to, and how long can I exist that way? And I guess the the strength of the ethics, the strength of those feelings of how I feel and how I want to live was stronger than any fear that I had. Mm. You know, I have this uh, philosophy, and I talk about this quite a bit, that um, we, for one thing, 
that as women, we're told that we can't do certain things. And we learn that from a very young age. In your case, it was very specific. Women weren't executive chefs. There's no Native American food. You know, There's to no speak women of. photographers that are director of photography. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on, on and on. Right. So we, but we hear a lot of those subtle messages from the time that we're born also. So we naturally have this feeling of like, I can't do this. This a woman shouldn't be doing this, whatever it is, you know, X, buy a house, go travel by herself. Um, when we start to waken up to the possibilities, I think that we might get an idea of, well, maybe I can be a professional photographer. Maybe I can be an executive chef. And then there's this transition that happens of, uh, you start to believe it. And then what you put behind you becomes unfulfilling or it becomes, it, you, there's so much fear going back to that old lifestyle that there's nothing to do but move forward. forward. And it sounds like that's exactly what happened to you is that you had maybe this little niggling sensation of you know, like, this is doesn't feel quite right. And then boom, somebody comes in and points out something really obvious to you. And you say, Oh, crap, I, I, I there's only forward now. Right. And <laughs> you know, it's not easy. My dad, because he was very conservative and first generation, you know, can I have a job like a human resource director or a secretary? He thought those were really good jobs for women because it was stable and you'd save for retirement. And and that's what he knew. And that's what he knew, which is fine. But that isn't, that's not who I am. That And I think my mom gave us enough, you know, if you, you know, it's just like, that movie, if you build it, they will come. You know, if you see it, if you feel it, if you breathe it, if you think it, you can manifest it. Do you think that you have to have a pain point before, not you, do you think in general people have to have a pain point before they make a change? Mm, some. I don't know if everyone does. But yeah, sometimes you hit rock bottom or there's, uh, you're in a car accident, you're, f you're physically changed. Uh, sometimes the universe does things, you know, we have no control over what happens to us. The only control we have is how we respond. And, you know, is your glass half full or half empty? I've always been half full, always. And I have lots of friends that are half empty and I love them and I can be around that. I just, that's not my core belief system. It's half full. I know some people think that, um, to get back to the kind of the pain point thing, because I think it's important, uh, some people do think that you, the only way people will change, some people think people don't change, period. Some people think people will only change if there's a pain point. And then, um, and I have the same belief that I think people will change, it doesn't have to, you don't have to hit rock bottom uh, to make a change. And I think that's a really important lesson also, because I think sometimes people will let things get so bad and then they make the change. I think there's a, there's a subconscious feeling of like, I have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Nowhere else to go. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, really great quote is nothing's beneath you when you've hit rock bottom. Right. So you will do anything, you know, cause it, cause you've got nowhere else to go. You can't go any lower than that. Y you know, I always, um, I think, you know, with all the work I've done, so, you know, if, and I, I went through a divorce, okay, so m my marriage um, didn't work, and, and I think when I got married, I, I always thought, oh, I'm going to grow old, I've known this guy, you know, blah, blah, blah. When the crisis happened, I went and got help, whether it was my friends, um, but professional help, people that are trained to help me, and I always think of it as, if I fall skiing and I break my arm, I don't go see a dentist. Why would I see a dentist for my broken arm? I see a specialist or a sports doctor to help me repair my arm and do it well and do it the best. So if I have an emotional problem or I'm not happy in my job or I don't have enough abundance or whatever it is in my life, who is the specialist in that field that can guide you and help you? And I make an investment in that. I make an investment in me. Uh, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't really afford a massage. You know, that's extravagant. For me, it's a necessity. It's a tune-up. Yeah. So I physically have energy moved around my body via a massage every six to eight weeks. 
every, I like it once a month. My schedule doesn't always allow that. When, and I have a life coach that I go to for, you know, uh, tweakings and I have counselors and I don't go all the time. And you have community. And I have community. And and that's a big thing because that is. uh, Women's groups and men's groups and spirituality. And um, I can go to temple or church or ceremony, whatever it is. Yeah. Because that's more or less free for the person who has the excuse of, or, you know, or think things that they have the excuses they can't afford it um there is community and then that brings it back to food too doesn't it <laughs> well, because we have we have community around the food, food and, and around the experience yeah. which is uh which is really great one thing that we didn't talk about is uh your accolades your book is a james beard award-winning book it isn't is it? congratulations on that that's been a number of years now is that right yeah. what year was that so i'm due yeah it's uh this was 2004 Mm -hmm. and uh, I am due for another book and maybe another James Beard Award. Yeah, absolutely. I um, am honored. This was, uh, you know, I I think the funniest thing is when, you know, you get nominated uh, and you go and it's black tie and, you know, James Beard is, it's it's an amazing foundation. What's the process of being nominated? So uh, books are submitted, you know, through your agent or through the publisher or through yourself and then they get down to the finalists and there's at least in for me there were three finals but what they don't tell you is as you and of course you accept the invitation you have to spend your own dime to go to new york and get a hotel and wear black tie and sit in the audience like the academy awards you're nominated right and so i'm the chatty one walter came with me my husband came came with me and they seat you next to your competition but they don't tell you that so i turned you know to the right and i'm like oh you know, are you excited? What are you here for? You know, and they said, Texas Cowboy Barbecue. And I have this lump in my throat and I'm thinking, I wonder what category. So what category, which is Americana, which is the same category as us. And then I turned to the other side and it was uh, sort of America the Bounty, a little of, of a lot. And I wasn't as concerned, but I'm sitting there and the, I have this lump in my throat and I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. It's the Cowboys and the Indians <laughs> again. <laughs> what is it about American history that does this? And... Uh, you know, Jacques Pepin was the announcer at the time, and he's very French, and nobody could understand him. And so the Cowboys are like, it's the Indians. They were just happy they understood him. But in that one moment, they realized if it's the Indians, it's not the Cowboys. Um, and we just looked at each other, and we said, you know, it's 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 time for the Indians. So it was okay. There's this, you know, sort of amazing moment. And uh, Was that a joint? No, uh, Walter's your business partner. and uh, Walter came with me. Walter's yeah, always great. been a big part of what I do. And he likes to be a little more quiet and do the, the savory part. I still do all the baking and all the desserts, you know, as well as running the company and interfacing with clients and staffing and all of those things. But Walter loves the, the savory. And I think he has a very beautiful aesthetic in the food. How should we present it? And he has a good palate. So... Uh, We've been working together since, um, gosh, I'm going to say 1991, maybe 1992. So a long time. Maybe what I'll do um, in the show notes is uh, post some photos from our dinner, which when you talk about the presentation, it's just, uh, yeah, it's really great. Yeah. So yes, I think you're due for another one, but congratulations on that because that is a really big deal. Um, Since that time of of the publication of that book, you've also, uh, you've changed your thinking, I, I believe you've changed your thinking around um, food preparation and also your own lifestyle right. in terms of eating. And as you mentioned earlier, mostly plant-based, you'll have some meat. I think it's more ethical eating probably um, in terms of the meat that you do eat. Yeah, I don't do any commercial meats anymore. So I I, I, I don't like the way uh, animals are being raised in factories. I think it's inhumane from an ethical standpoint. But I also think that if an animal is raised in fear or in a condition that's not the way the animal was meant to live. Um, and that's why I only eat wild now, like uh, an elk that's mm-hmm. taken down or a deer or a bison. Uh, because for them, they live a normal life, like a deer or an elk, and they forage and they and then they have one bad day. One bad day. And the bad day is the day someone takes their life. But factory farm raised or commercial meats um, it's very inhumane and there's suffering. And I don't, I don't know if you notice, but I'm very body conscious. And so, you know, when I get fear, I feel like, <gasps> oh, of course, you know, and you feel that adrenaline, you, do you feel, feel every muscle in your body just tighten. 
imagine living your whole life like that. And then imagine eating another animal that lived like that. And so for me, I'm out. Not to mention the antibiotics and everything else. To keep them alive because they're in a constant state of, if we talk about flight or fear, they're in stress. And I I just, I don't want to eat that. You know, if we think of our bodies as a temple and we think of, we are what we eat. Why would I want to eat that? that and you and you've also so gone. I don't. Yeah, I just don't. Yeah, I, I, I rather the happy lettuce and the the happy sprouts <laughs> and the, the happy corn from the farmer that's singing and these. Uh, you had a salad. It's, it was so alive. I bought it that morning and the the tomatoes and someone said, "Oh, these are the best tomatoes so far this season." And all of those things that are alive and and growing in accordance with nature. And I'm much more pro that than I am. Uh, you know, eating something, you know, uh, that is tons of meat where it was inhumanely raised. I'm, and part of I what just, you're doing too is you're going back to uh, the reservations and the tribes and your... Ancestral te- diet. Yeah. Right. And you're teaching and... Um, For health and wellness. Right. And sharing this information. Diabetes. We're looking it's at huge. gardens and then, yeah, um, eating a lot less meat. I think the, the American palate, you know, I see commercials and it's like the most cheese and the most pepperoni. And we, the truth is we were not designed to have a, a high fat, high meat diet like that. And I feel much cleaner. I don't have what's called a food hangover. Mm-hmm. You know, when I don't have the butter and the cream and the meat and I feel lighter, my body has responded. I love my body. And, uh, that is just, and you're healthier, and I'm you're healthier. and you're. Seeing... I'm the healthiest I've ever been. Yeah. So my A1C, which is sugar in the blood, uh, is at four point five, which uh. is the lowest. Uh, is fourth. I'm perfect. perfect. Con- yeah, yeah. Congratulations. And then you're teaching that to um, the folks uh, that uh, in the in the local native communities. Yeah. We've had funding to do the eight northern pueblos. I've been working with communities in Arizona, the Navajo Nation. Yeah. And it's specifically directed at diabetes or just overall health? Overall health, but I work a lot with diabetes educators and I'm certified uh, with the CDC as a, a diabetes prevention program educator, so DPP. And I do a lot with train the trainer. So we want to train those educators to then work in their communities. We want to also train and let the community members taste things. And uh, health conferences, everybody's doing you know health and wellness. And it's not only food. You can't only eat well. You also have to exercise. And you, if, when you're out in nature, we see that it lowers your stress levels. And if you have a quiet moment, corporations are now calling it mindfulness. Um, You might call it meditation or quiet time, right? Of just reflecting. And all of that is part of health. Focusing and appreciation and enjoying and tasting, which all makes a difference when you, when you sit down to a meal as well. Quiet time, you know, you don't need to eat your meal in front of the TV or or with your, um, you know, just what, what are the, the elements on the plate and what's nourishing you today. And I don't know, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm a little different that way, but I, I do feel better and I'm the healthiest I've ever been. Well, thank you for what you do in the community too. I, th- I think that's amazing. And I, and I, and I feel like there is a, um, there's a wave that's going on, you know, in the U S right now, that's a that kind of a pendulum swing away from so much of the processed food. People are realizing that, uh, the reason why there's so many commercials on TV for, drug manufacturers is because we've just gone way off the deep end, but there's a more natural way to heal ourselves. And that is through food and better diet and exercise. And I think people are coming around to that now. So you're, I think so. yeah, you're doing that for the, the you know, people think, here. Oh, wow. Look at these, you know, I always use the, the example of cinnamon buns. There's 12 of them for $3 and 99 cents. What a bargain. And really the truth of it is it's not a bargain because it's, it's gluten and it's highly refined and it's so high in sugar, much sugar, so much sugar. And it's not a bargain anymore. The, the mantra for me is less of a better quality. You know, how much should a real loaf of bread cost? Five, six, seven dollars? Yeah. How much should a, a pound of organic lettuce cost or sprouts cost? And I'm not afraid to make a conscious decision. And, you know, I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, how can we afford that? So a pound of dried beans is 99 cents for pinto beans. And that feeds, you know, a family of six. For a week? Yeah. (laughs) Probably. Right. So we we just have to shift. We're recondition, rethink it, 
be bold. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Be bold in all the decisions. Great. Well, uh, Lois, thank you so much for your time. And um, is there anything that you'd like to cover or add that we missed out on today? No, I guess if I were to say one thing, you know, to people out there, it would be um, find your true self. What is your true self? And how do you live that? And how, how can you be that? And, and, you know, what do you want? Just start asking your questions. There's four questions in Native tradition that we, we always are told from a very young age. Who am I? Uh, where did I come from? Where am I going? So what do you want to accomplish? What's the legacy you want to leave behind? And how am I going to get there? And that's the vice, those, those are the spokes. How am I going to get to that center place where I leave a legacy and I feel good about what I've done in my life? And I don't look back and say, I wish I had you do it, even if it's scary. And realize that there's those of us out there, we're scared too, you know, but you walk into that circle, you walk into that place and you say, it's going to work. And it does. It sounds so simple. I know. It does. It It sounds really simple. It is. Yeah. It's simple, but it's not easy. I know. Right. So how does someone uh, sit down and get in touch with that? It's going to be different um, for everyone. I wish I had a formula that I could say works for everybody but your formula for where you've gotten to where you are and my formula for where I've gotten to where I am might be a little different and so experiment you know uh, with different practitioners or different groups or different senses of community and you'll know immediately when it resonates there's a feeling of ah I found my family and there's a saying that we always say um, you're in my tribe And you're in my tribe doesn't mean immediate family it doesn't mean blood it means a sense that you have my back, I have your back, together we're accomplishing something, you're my perfect client, you're my great friend, you're my colleague, I want to work with you, I want to work with more people like you, and so you feel it, and if you just allow, you're like, okay, I need more of this, and as you put those desires out to have more, then you attract more. You know, there's that saying, birds of a feather flock together, so if you're so different, you can't be You know, I always think of, for instance, um, let's say a heroin addict. So a heroin addict can't be with sober people because they're a heroin addict. They can only be with other heroin addicts because that's what they're doing. But as soon as you make a conscious decision to become sober, you can't hang out with the heroin addicts anymore. You have to go into a group or a setting that allows you to be sober. And so that's what I mean by that, is finding the like. And if you don't like where you are, then start to look for others that are where you want to be. And that's the first shift. That's the beginning. And then you'll notice that it's like dominoes. Oh, you meet one and you're like, oh, I met so-and-so and and I'm so happy. And I'm in this free group or this counseling or whatever it is. Or I found a yoga group or I found a meditation group or I found this video online. I get the daily um. You know, I I get Abraham Hicks every day and I, I, I spend the time and I read it, which is some sort of affirmation. Um, that changes my life, that makes me think. And those are free. And when you're open to that, and when you start to pursue that, then more comes into your life. Isn't that true? I do. I think Mm -hmm. that. It's the domino. You Mm -hmm. And birds of a feather. And then all of a sudden, you're surrounded, your life is exactly what you want, and you're happy, Mm -hmm. and you're blessed, and you're thankful. And the more blessed and happy and thankful you are, the more you have. And the more you attract that, And the more you attract. Wow, that's such a great note to stop on. Thank you so much, Lois. This is really really special. Oh, good. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Where can people find you? I am in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Mm -hmm. and my website is www.redmesacuisine.com. And we did just redo our website, so I'm pretty proud of it. It's beautiful. And then I also have another website, which is my photography. You can see some of the travels and things I've done, and that's loisphoto.com. So we'll add links to that in the show notes. Okay. Thanks again. You're welcome. And now we get to go eat tamales. Yay! (laughs) Didn't you love that? She is so grounded and centered. It just makes me feel calmer just listening to her. If you enjoyed our conversation, consider joining our Santa Fe Culinary Tour next June. That's actually women only. As of right now, we are already about a third full on that tour, and it does always sell out. So don't hesitate if you're thinking of joining us, and Lois will be cooking for us during that trip. A reminder that if you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, and leave a review. Those reviews really do help uh, the podcast get more exposure, and ultimately it helps us grow our Be Bold community. 
I bet you know a few people in your world who would also enjoy today's conversation and this podcast in general. So please do share. Podcasts are a new thing for some people. So if you've got a friend who doesn't know how to download them, take a moment to give them a lesson. I'm working on launching a website dedicated to the podcast, but in the meantime, you can find out more about me by visiting wanderlustandlipstick.com as well as wandertours.com. And that's where you'll see the tours I lead around the world, as well as our culinary tours to Santa Fe, New Orleans, and Seattle. It's worth mentioning that soon you'll be able to purchase Be Bold gear and accessories. I encourage you to check out the Wonder World Foundation, the nonprofit I founded to help women and children in developing countries. I'll put links to all those sites in the show notes as well, and I'll also include links to Lois's books and some other things that we mentioned. You can find all of that on wanderlustandlipstick.com forward slash podcast. Sign up for my newsletter on the Wanderlust and Lipstick site, and you'll receive tips on making your travels more bold. You can friend me on Facebook, and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. If you know of any high-performing, adventurous, philanthropic women whom you think might be a good guest, shoot me a note or leave a comment. Uh, Finally, the ladies can join us on our Be Bold Facebook group. That's where you'll find our growing community. It's where we share goals, talk about our setbacks, and where you can find words of encouragement and inspiration from others. It's a private Facebook group, so what you post there is uh, just limited to the group itself. And we've got about 2,000 women on there. It's pretty cool. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Be Bold podcast. Until next time, be bold. Be bold.